Hello everyone and welcome again to another webinar with my partner in Barcelona, Spain, Ferti. Today I have the amazing honor to be with uh, Dr. Maria Arquet and we're going to talk today about lifestyle, diet and fertility. I am very happy to have you here, Maria. It's an honor to meet you because it's also the first time that we meet in person, basically. So before we jump into our webinar, I want uh, you to introduce yourself to the group. Talk a little bit about yourself and what you do in, with 30, what is your role, and then we can jump into our questions. We have a few people already registered, and all the members of our group are looking forward to this beautiful information and tools that we provide. Welcome, Maria. Perfect. Monica, thank you so much for your kind introduction. It is a pleasure for me to be here today. Um, so basically, I am an OBGYN and I'm specialized in infertility. I've done most of my studies here in Barcelona. And then I spent part of my time when I was training also in the United States. I've done an internship at Yale. And then uh, I came back to Europe and I trained in Barcelona for a couple of years in one of the biggest clinics in Barcelona, uh, getting, getting my, my education on fertility. And then I also uh, stayed uh, in Ireland for almost three years, working there with international patients. And one of my fields of expertise and one of the main fields that I'm interested in is uh, how lifestyle and diet affect uh, fertility and how they affect IVF outcomes. And in fact, this has been the topic of my PhD and one of the things that I have been studying the most. Apart from that, I'm also very interested in fertility preservation and a lot of other topics related with infertility. And uh, it will be a pleasure for me to, to have a, a small discussion and, and just to speak a little bit about what do we know about how diet and lifestyle can affect fertility and which are our views. And I will be happy to, to answer any questions if anyone wants to ask anything. That's wonderful, Maria. Thank you so much for your introduction. And yes, you know, definitely our lifestyle, our diet and whatever, you know, we do in our daily life and we put in our body affects definitely our fertility. And yes, I have a few questions because, you know, I was kind of making a survey in the group and it came, we, we came up with basically five questions that are kind of um, uh, resume the, the, the subject. It's a big subject, so it could be more, but we try our best to uh, provide the general questions that can close all the, the subject. The first one that I want to ask you is, and, and most people ask themselves, what are the most important factors that determine the likelihood of success of ART? Yeah, so basically when we speak about the factors, I, I like to divide them into two very big kinds of groups. The one that would be the non-modifiable factors, mm -hmm. which mainly for women would be age and ovarian reserve. We know that basically one of the main limitations that we all women have when we want to have babies is the fact that we are born with all the eggs that we have and we don't keep on producing no eggs during our whole life. So both quality and quantity of eggs start to decline with age and there is a very important decline after the age of 35. But unfortunately, there's nothing that we can proactively do to change that because our, even though we look fantastic when we are 45, uh, our eggs are 45 and there's nothing yes. that we can do about that. But there are a lot of other factors there's what called the modifiable factors that, that are the ones that mainly depend on our lifestyle and diet. And also uh, those can have a very important effect, both positive or negative, on our likelihood of having a successful outcome with a fertility treatment and a successful pregnancy and a healthy baby. And basically those, those factors would be our BMI, to have a healthy BMI, or obesity or being very underweight can have uh, negative effects. Also physical activity, uh, stress, diet, smoking, um, also alcohol, and, and also there's a lot of, of controversy about coffee and caffeine, if we should be taking coffee or not. Yes, and uh, then the patterns of the diets that we have that we can discuss it with a little bit more detail if you want. But those would be generally the, the, important, the most important aspects that I think that can determine the likelihood of a, of a successful outcome with, a, with the treatment. 
Yes. Now you mentioned something, and, and you know, I have in the in the group some uh, of the members that they are um, in the age between the you know, like I will say, mid twenties and mid thirties. You know that range, which is before the age of thirty five, like you say. So one of the things now that you mentioned is smoking and alcohol. So they come, you know, and say to me, you know, I have these issues maybe because when I was younger, you know, when I was a teenager, I drink a lot, I smoke a lot. Uh, which kind of makes sense uh, to me, but, you know, I'm more the, of the emotional support. You are a doctor. Do you think that, the you know, for this range of age, if they, let's put it between, you know, like this abuse, or if they took too much alcohol when they were younger, before they decide, you know, to enter into the parenthood um, life, if they smoke, you know, cigarettes or drugs, yeah. or they took too much alcohol, could that past is affected what they are having today? Is that kind of related? Yeah, that's a very good question, Monica, in fact. So if we speak about smoking, with smoking, we have we have a lot of very clear evidence on that. Obviously, it will be much worse if you keep on smoking while you're doing the treatment or you're trying to conceive that if you smoked in the past. But we know that um, smoking can, it's related to um, to having a more premature menopause, so mm -hmm. it makes the decline of the number of eggs quicker. It can even we could even have our menopause even 40 years before we would have it if we did not smoke. It is also related with poorer uh, egg quality, egg quantity, and also and the quality and quantity as well. So obviously, I for me, whenever someone is about to do a fertility treatment, I think that it's super important to try to not blame ourselves about what we've done in the past because okay. maybe in, in the past you were not in the position of knowing, having that knowledge, and we all have been young at some point, but the important thing is what you can you proactively do right now. And obviously, if you're smoking, for me, the very strong recommendation would be to quit smoking. Uh, regarding alcohol, with alcohol, uh, with alcohol the, the information is a little bit more contradictory, but what we know is that obviously it is very clear that once we are pregnant, we cannot drink alcohol because that's related with a lot of malformations on the baby, with also uh, abstinence syndrome for the baby if we drink alcohol, and a lot of very detrimental effects, and that's the main reason we cannot drink if we're pregnant. Having said that, when we speak about drinking alcohol during when we are young or before the fertility treatment, it doesn't look like it has a very important negative effect when we're speaking about social and occasional drinking. Obviously, if we're speaking about drinking a lot of alcohol, it would have a negative effect. And what is a lot and what is not a lot, because mm -hmm. this can be very ambiguous, okay? So generally speaking, the the nice guidelines, that are the main guidelines that they use in the UK and are the guidelines about excellent practice in medicine, would say that we, would, we should not drink more than one unit of alcohol a day if we're women. And when I say one unit, one unit would be... Um, half a glass of wine. So mm -hmm. one glass of wine would be two units. So it's very, very small amount of alcohol that we can take. The, the general recommendation in that sense would be, it is okay if every now and then you go out for dinner and you fancy a glass of wine or you want to have one day a cocktail. But I would not recommend for anyone who's drinking on a daily basis to keep on drinking every day, not only for reproductive for reproductive purposes, but also for overall health. We we really have a lot a lot of data about the negative impact that can that alcohol can have on our overall health. Yes, definitely. You you are you are so right. It's um, it's not only our fertility; it's yeah. in general. Uh, that was very, you know, that was very um, important that you help us clarify that because, as you mentioned, you know, we definitely need to see what we are doing now to make it better. And then that takes me actually to the next question, which is what we can do to improve our chances of success. Anyone that is walking this fertility journey, you know, what they can do to improve yeah. their chances. Here with that question, which I think that it's super important, Monica, as well. Uh, first of all, I wanna I wanna mention again what I was saying before. Uh, I think that it's very important that everyone uh, releases themselves from any blame or any guilt, because mm -hmm. obviously that is part of that situation of infertility that we cannot control, and no one chooses. 
to be yes. infertile or to have a problem. And that's very important. So obviously there's part of this that we can do, but even if we have the healthiest lifestyle in the world, uh, that's not going to change our ovarian reserve. Neither is going to change our age. Okay, mm -hmm. it can help a little bit, and probably then we will have a healthier pregnancy. Our baby will be healthier, and and all those things. But that cannot make up for other stuff. Having said that, my recommendations would be: if you smoke, quit smoking. If you drink alcohol, I would just uh, reduce the amount of alcohol and would leave it only for special occasions and very limited amount of alcohol. I would recommend everyone to try to have a healthy BMI. And the BMI to be considered healthy should be between 18.5 and maximum 25, okay? Anything that is under 18.5 would be considered underweight and more than 25 would be considered overweight and then there's also obesity. I would also recommend to be physically active, uh, basically to do at least moderate activity on daily basis, walk. Uh, it's not necessary to go to the gym and do high intensity trainings or anything like that, okay? But just be active. Walk, uh, if you like yoga, do yoga, go to walk your dog, if you, if you have your dog. Uh, anything that is related with having a healthy and active lifestyle. Then uh, for me also, uh, having... Um, a good good control of your stress it's very important as well the tools that we use for stress control are very different there's people who i don't know they find very relaxing cooking for example and there's yes. people who for example likes to do some meditation some yoga i have lots of patients who do yoga and meditation and they have very uh, very positive uh, effects from that and Myself, I can say that uh, meditation and yoga help me a lot to cope with stress as well. So I really encourage people to at least give it a try. Um, and then apart from that, I try to sleep uh, enough yes. and that the quality of the sleep is important. Sometimes we just sacrifice sleeping to do, to do, to do a lot of things. And, and we... And we forget about how important this is. And then the, the, the last thing, uh, but for me, one of the most crucial ones as well is um, diet, okay? In terms of, of diet, uh, obviously, it's not a matter of getting crazy. And uh, there is a lot of information there out in internet and social media about the diet that we should be doing. We, we live in a culture of dieting and diet. Uh, can be super overwhelming all the info is contradictory at the end of the day you don't know what you should be doing the things that we know for sure that we should be avoiding are uh, everything that is related with um, processed foods uh, sugary drinks anything that it's uh, that has trans fats and all that stuff all those things should be avoided or at least minimize and just have it on a very special occasion if you really love it Okay, and then base our diet on, on foods that are mainly not as natural as possible, if they are organic, better, and that we have, we know about the source, uh, that they are from a good source, good quality, then there's people who might decide for ethical reasons, for religion, because of climate change, because of whatever, they might decide to go vegan or vegetarian, which I completely support. Uh, in those cases, I think that it's super, super important that uh, they have a little bit of knowledge about nutrition because uh, it is relatively easy to not have enough intake of protein if you go vegan or vegetarian. And then the other super important thing that it's mandatory for anyone who goes vegan or vegetarian is to take supplement of B12 because otherwise you will most likely be deficient. Um, and having said that, I think that those are the most important things. Yeah, it's, it's incredible what you say about the B12, because yes, we, we are vegan here and in my house, and B12 is one of the things that we must take, and we can talk even about that a little later. Now, talking about diet, you know, it's all linked with the next question. How diet can impact ARP outcomes? You know, is there a fertility diet? You know, like someone said, okay, so what is exactly the diet I need to do? What tools are recommended when trying to conceive and undergoing on any fertility treatment when it comes to that diet itself. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of research uh, with this. I'm going to try to focus on the on the things that we have more knowledge, okay, yes. that we 
more data, I will start with folic acid. Okay, we know okay. that folic acid is completely it's essential for pregnancy and to avoid that the baby has any defects of, of the neural tube, so from, from the from the brain and all the neurological system. Um, the World Health Organization recommends that we take at least 400 micrograms a day of, of folic acid whenever we are looking for a pregnancy, and we should start at least two or three months before we are getting pregnant. Uh, there are some specific patients that might have some mutations or that might be taking some specific medication, and they might require higher, higher doses of folic acid. But other than that, it should be like this. Uh, there is growing data saying that patients who have higher um, higher levels of folic acid and who have been supplemented with higher levels look like they had uh, higher chances of having a live birth and the results of the treatments were better. So in general, I recommend to be supplemented with 800 micrograms instead of the, of the only 400. Okay. Then uh, the second important uh, Thing that I wanted to, to speak about is vitamin D because there has been a lot of controversy and that about vitamin D. So that vitamin D seems crucial in animals and it uh, for the research that we have, uh, for what we've seen so far, it doesn't look like it is as important in humans. Having said that, uh, it is not as important as long as we have enough vitamin D. And the main problem is that uh, most of the population is deficient or insufficient in vitamin D because the main way that we metabolize vitamin D is through through the skin when we are exposed to the sun. Yes. To, metabolize, to metabolize well the vitamin D, we should be uh, taking a little bit of sun without sunscreen. And obviously that has to be in a very small window of time and in a moment that it is not the worst moment in which we are exposed. Like for example, at 9 a.m. or 10 a.m. in the morning, never at one or at three, yes. you know? Um, having said that, probably most of the people would benefit from taking a, a, a supplement of vitamin D because most of us, we are uh, deficient. Okay, so there are some foods that are already fortified, which is fine, and it's all obviously better to, to expose ourselves a little bit to the sun, um, but that's something to take in consideration, but it's not like we need to supplement much more, because if we are not insufficient or deficient for vitamin D, it doesn't make much difference in terms okay. of likelihood of success. Then um, there is some data also uh, against and uh, in favor of uh, dairy. Uh, yeah. res results are not conclusive, okay? You can find arguments against and you can find a lot of arguments uh, in favor of. There's nothing conclusive. So in that sense, I would say that if you're doing that for calcium or for vitamins or for um, um, any dietary beliefs, you can still take the same nutrients from other sources. That should not be a concern. But if you really like milk, there is no reason why you should stop drinking it, okay? And the other important thing is uh, omega-3 and uh, yes. fatty acids. Uh, omega-3 fatty acids are essential uh, fatty acids, and it is very important uh, that we have an, enough source uh, of them because they are involved in a lot of processes. Um, the best sources of... Um, of the omega-3 or the easiest ones to get would be from, from oily fish, okay? Yes. So really good quality fish like salmon or uh, also we can get it from tuna and from other small fishes. It is also possible to take uh, omega-3 from plants, especially from um, uh, seaweed, see, not seaweed, yeah, seaweed, but it's more difficult to get it because we don't have that, that much available. There are also pl plant supplements that we can take with the, with the seaweed uh, just to have it in the case that you were uh, vegan, for example, or, or vegetarian. Okay, but this is uh, a source that is important and it has also been linked that the better uh, levels of omega-3 we have, the, the, it has been related with better morphology of the embryos and it looks like the results are also better. It is also important that the ratio between omega-6 and omega-3 is fine because in the past we tended to have a, a much more balanced ratio and now it turns like we are taking too much omega-6 and not enough omega-3. 
So it's also a matter of that. Then there are some, some results uh, from some studies saying that um, soya might be beneficial. Also small yeah. studies are clear, but it doesn't look like it can have a negative effect even though it has been considered for a long time, like it might be a, an endocrine disruptor because obviously the soya has uh, what we call phytoestrogens, so oh, yes. it's from plants, but it, do, it doesn't look like they have a negative effect on the, on the uh, possibilities of getting a pregnancy and also with ART. Uh, and those are the most important ones that I wanted to mention and the ones that we have more, more info about. And then, obviously, there is clear data about what I was speaking a little bit before, which are the dietary patterns. When we're trying to look for the definition of a healthy diet, uh, there's not a unique definition for it. Okay. Right? Yes. But it is true that most of the diets that are considered um, uh, that are healthy, uh, with the Mediterranean diet and all those things, they all have some some things in common, okay? And the things yeah. that they have in common is that basically are based on fresh fruit and vegetables, grains uh, that are whole, whole grains, uh, good sources of lean uh, protein from from good uh, fish and and meat and eggs if you if you have a, a diet that you eat also animals and also good quality fats like from olive oil avocado nuts yes. and all that stuff and avoiding all the other things that are not necessary okay so that would be the the things that are uh, generally uh included in any healthy diet and uh, obviously the things that are included in a non-healthy diet we also know which ones they are yes. and everything related with processed foods or anything that can last in our fridge for over a week probably is not that good okay so uh, having said that the recommendation again uh, I want to stress that for, because for me it's very important to try to to have uh, habits that are uh, as much as possible to have that very, very much natural diet. And yes. uh, it might take some time to, to get used to it, especially if you come from a diet that is very processed. And sometimes it's not as convenient as, as a diet of everything, having all your meals ready in the fridge from something that has already been pre-prepared in the supermarket. But uh, your health is going to have... Uh, a very positive impact if you if you do those changes. It's uh, it's uh, so important what you just mentioned to try to make it more natural. And I know it's also like you said difficult uh, mm -hmm. for people that is uh, used to that kind of process um, diets that you said. But you know, yes, it's always been a balance. I think that when we are ready to start to try to conceive, even if it is naturally, or even if it is through any medical um, uh, treatment, we definitely need to kind of put a stop a little bit in our mind and see, okay, what I, like you said in the beginning, what I need to do now to improve my chances of success. So make a changes in certain things until at least I get that success, have a healthy baby, and then even can help me to go back to a healthy habits, even if I don't want to continue uh, parenthood way. So there is also another two things that you mentioned in the beginning, the stress and sleep. How can stress and lack of sleep affect fertility? Yeah, so basically stress, uh, obviously when, when our bodies are in that, in that situation of, of of uh, fly or, fight or fight, I think that it's the, the, the yes. stress. Uh, it's like we're not we're not allowing ourselves to 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 be in the best position to conceive. Yes, right. I mean, obviously, the data that we have is limited, and there is nothing like super proven saying mm -hmm. that stress can have a negative effect on on pregnancy unless we are under very very high levels of stress like people who are in the middle of a war or things like this but obviously it's not going to make any benefit to your health to be under stress okay yes. the same with sleeping uh, it can come to a point that if you have a, a very high stress um very high stress, you can lose your period. And also um, it can have some, uh, the lack of sleep can also have some negative impact on your hormone balance. So so ha having said that, uh, and as I said before, to, to be completely healthy and have a healthy lifestyle, I think that we need to prioritize our, our rest, 
and instead of doing too much things as we do, try to have good quality sleep. There is like a lot of, of things that we can do to improve our sleep hygiene. And uh, some of those can be some sometimes difficult because we're so used to have our phones and be checking social media and apps and whatever all the time. But for a lot of people, uh, for example, if you exercise, usually it's better that you exercise. If you do something that it's very active, it's better that you do that in the morning because a lot of cortisol will be released and afterwards you're going to be very activated. And then uh, in the evening, it's better that if you engage on doing some physical activity, it's better that you do things that are more relaxing, like yoga or just going for a walk or things like that. Mm -hmm. Just having a nice shower when you go back home, something very light for dinner, which is also going to help us to to promote uh, having a healthy um, BMI and not increasing our weight. And also will help us with digestion. And usually we recommend also to wait at least a couple of hours until you go to sleep since you ate uh, uh, for the last time. And then uh, probably instead of looking at any screen and being exposed to all this blue light that makes us uh, much uh, make it much more difficult to rest to just read a book or do some kind of another activity that doesn't expose us to a screen as we as most of us spend the whole day in front of a computer so yes. that would be it. and also set kind of set a time for going to sleep relatively early at least on your daily basis uh, and trying to ensure that you will have at least seven or eight hours of good quality sleep Yes, it's incredible what you just said because it's true. We most uh, most of us in all over the world we spend our time in the screen, especially now after all of these, you know, situation is even more. And then you know we think that okay, we're gonna rest, and then you're gonna watch a show or something is more a time exposed there, and then the time goes by. It happens, you know, to me sometimes we sit and watch uh, with my husband a show, and it's like you know it's one in the morning. Come on, let's go to sleep. It's like. Your, you, you don't train your brain and it's so important for the for not only fertility but from our daily performance you know as as, as, a, as humans so you are so yeah. right um and, and by lacking of sleep you are you know increasing the stress in our bodies so right what you said maria now you mentioned uh, all along with the stress uh, how to you know good sleep and then in, in the part of the diet, you mentioned uh, all the supplements that, you know, we need to take or that, that they are main to improve our fertility. So my last question is, uh, so we know what the supplements are and we know what are the ones that you recommend. So if I am going through a fertility journey along with a partner, because, you know, today there is a lot of women that want to, you know, do IVF or something and they just want um, be single mom, so they look for the sperm donor. But when we are going along with our partner, with our husband, should my partner take that supplements too, or which are the supplements that he should be taking? Yeah, that's a great question, and uh, not, not it doesn't have <laughs> how it is yet. But uh, let's yeah, let, let's explain that in in the most straightforward way possible. So uh, obviously, there is a lot of um, economical interest on all the supplements for any kind of treatment for fertility treatments for anything okay so there's you will find a lot on the internet a lot of things claiming that they are going to make you fertile and your sperm is going to be fantastic and your eggs <laughs> are going to be young again and everything having said that obviously there are some supplements that can have a positive impact on the quality of the sperm for example and there are some supplements as i said as i mentioned before that is the folic acid the vitamin d the nutrition vitamin b uh, com complex d uh, and especially vitamin b12 if we are vegan and all those things that are necessary and there are some other supplements that may have a positive effect on the quality of the sperm and maybe on the outcomes, but it is not that certain. The last Cochrane review, which is one of the most important reviews that, that they do uh, regarding medical evidence, says that it looks like giving some supplements with antioxidants, especially for males who have sperm quality that it's a little bit low, uh, it can have a positive effect on the sperm quality and maybe afterwards with the outcomes. Having said that, the main problem that we have 
is that all these studies that are included in the Cochrane review are very different. They have used different kinds of combinations of super of antioxidants and in different doses. So it is almost impossible to know which one of those is the one that is responsible for that increase in the, yeah. in, the, in the parameters and which one is the one that is responsible for, for all that. So it's difficult to make a specific recommendation. Having said that, obviously, there are some of those that are always included, like the zinc, selenium, vitamin E, vitamin C. All those are usually always included in, in, the, in those supplements. Having said that, what I would say is that I think that in patients who have um, some alterations in the sperm quality, it would be indicated and it would be fine to take a, multi, a multivitamin uh, supplement with antioxidants. But having said that, for me, it is more important that the, that person uh, quit smoking, starts exercising if he's overweight and has a very healthy diet and has a lot of intake of natural antioxidants with the diet rather than taking the supplement okay yes. so for me it doesn't make much sense to okay I keep on smoking i just don't exercise and i keep on eating my hamburgers and processed food but then i take my supplement that's it no, 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 it doesn't go like that okay yes, totally. it's much more important to do that all the other things which for me are the are the bases, are the, the basic things that we should be doing. And then on the top of that, if we take those supplements, in those cases would be indicated. Otherwise, if the sperm is completely normal, I think that there is no need to spend money on that, honestly speaking. Yes, it's definitely what you mentioned is so important because, you know, yeah, we, we we have that tendency of like, okay, I can do this, 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 and I still take my vitamins. And it's like, we have that thought that, oh, this is going to take away what I am doing damage to myself, you know, like ignore that part. It's so, so important that and, and definitely go to more natural and take action on our health is what it is. So basically that was the five questions that, you know, kind of came with, after doing this survey, uh, Maria, I don't know if our audience has more questions or, you know, you, you want to touch any other uh, subject regarding this. Yeah, I mean, I, w I would like to ask you a few questions as well, yes. because we, we've been speaking a little bit before and you explained to me that you are vegan. Yes. So <laughs> I would be very curious to know, to ask you about uh, if you think that veganism can be beneficial for IVF. And uh, in that sense, uh, if there are any specific foods or any specific recommendations that you would give to patients who are vegan or who maybe are interested in having a more, a more plant-based diet, you know? Yes. So, yes, I, I was mentioned to you in the beginning before we jump into the life. Uh, yes, we became vegan here in our home about five years ago. Um, it was a little difficult. Uh, but then, you know, we went into, into searching why, you know, we are doing it. I was taking yoga classes, actually, um, when, uh, when we start in, uh, looking into that. It was before, actually, my last IBF. My, I did five uh, cycles of IBF, and uh, I was doing yoga, and uh, our yoga teacher, she was walking into, into veganism so she became vegan and then she started to do some dinners in her house and study a lot into that research uh so i finished my last idf and it was very difficult for me you know because regular food you know addictions can be to anything you know to smoking to food to alcohol to whatever so for me it was very difficult to think if i could be vegan because i loved eggs all my life since i remember my breakfast couldn't go without eggs every day from Monday through Sunday. So for me, it was like, how am I going to leave that? It's such a good taste and whatever. So then with her, we did like um, 14 days um, kind of not diet to lose weight, but to clean up our um, it, it taste bad. The taste buds, yeah. So it was lentils and rice only for 40 days. No salt, no nothing. Just lentils and rice. I almost went crazy. But then after that 14 days, when I start to taste, you know, the natural foods, like my fruits, my regular fruits, my regular veggies and all of that, it was so different. And it's a, it's a transition that after maybe a year, I start to see results in my skin. 
my periods start to be even less heavy. For example, my fertility issue is like I have double blockage of the tubes due to endometriosis. You know, endometriosis is heavy periods, pain that I even used to faint it from the pain of my cramps, mm -hmm. terrible. And I start to see like some kind of changes, good changes into my body. Doesn't mean like you say in the beginning that I'm going to tell a, a client, please become vegan because for every person works different. Mm -hmm. So I start to see that changes in my body. I didn't want, of course, to have more children because I already have my last girl, but I start to see that improving in, in that fertility part, in my physical part. So when someone comes to me and say, okay, I would like to try vegan. The first yeah. thing that I will ask them is like, but you are, you, you are vegan, you are vegetarian, or you are eating some animal product. I will never tell them cut this in one shot. Mm -hmm. Yes, I will tell them if you want to try that, slowly, slowly adjust. So for protein, like you say, for example, in, my, in, in a vegan diet, I uh, recommend uh, broccoli. Broccoli has uh, sometimes, it's, uh, it's according, you know, I don't know how truth the research are, but a lot of doctors uh, that are recommending veganism, they say that the broccoli has 20 gram more, 20 more grams than the regular, you know, uh, animal protein. So broccoli has a lot of protein. Definitely avocados. Avocados are well known in our vegan and non-vegan world that they are very healthy fats. Um, and of course, vitamin B12. So I try to get my supplements from vegan sources too. Like you say, for example, the vitamin D3, uh, you know, from uh, vegan sources and uh, the omega-3 from, uh, you know, seaweed plants. And, uh, you know, I look for companies that they are kind of good. I don't go like you say, and because like you say, there's so much scam out there. Wow. Uh, and for people, for example, that uh, want to go vegetarian and cut a little bit on the dairy because, you know, dairy, they, they might think or they might find out that dairy is not so good on their bodies. So I tell them, listen, if you are not going to jump into vegan salmon and fish, you know, the salmon is the, is the fish that I suggest to them because it's the healthiest one from my point of view. Um, the, the vitamin D3, for example, like you said, Sun is the main provider, and it's very difficult to find it in food. Uh, from the research that I have been doing since I started to be vegan, mushrooms have a little bit of vitamin D. It's, it's the only food like I can find from all the risks that it has a little bit of vitamin D. So definitely, when we are vegan, we need more supplements, zinc, you know, B12, D. So I look into the natural stage. But definitely, you know, like vegetables, fruits, uh, healthy fats like avocado, olive oil, olives itself, you know, like they say seven olives is like a scrambled egg or like a sunny side egg. Like it's, so yeah. this is what I can suggest to uh, people that is working fertility journey. But like you said in the beginning, each of us go the way that we feel uh, better. And, and, and if we get recommendations from our nutritionist or doctor like you, so the idea is to have balance and yeah. the balance is okay like you said doesn't make sense to take a multivitamin if i am drinking and smoking every day because it's not going to help me so we need to make some changes in our routine and start to be more natural so if you eat meat try to eat you know meat from a uh, grass-fed uh, cows you know that they're organic they suffer less and all of that whatever it is and balance uh, and cut on unhealthy habits like you have you know mm -hmm. uh, smoking alcohol all of that it's very difficult when you are when we are vegan it's difficult because i it can sound to people oh, okay well, but you know what i eat this and i think it's healthy so it's about i put the, the the choice on the table and you know i can recommend you from my diet what could be healthy and then from your diet you see what is good and what you need to cut on
Absolutely, 100%. I wanted to take advantage of the fact that we're speaking about veganism now, just just to, to mention a couple of things that I think that are very important. As I said at the beginning, and I think that you have also mentioned it now, uh, I think that for anyone who wants to become vegan or is vegan, it's very important to have a little bit of knowledge about nutrition to make sure that your diet, and you have to watch a little bit more what you're eating just to make sure that you're not going to have any deficiencies because you're already cutting off on a lot of foods. And it's not that you cannot take all the nutrients that you that you need because obviously you can but it, you just have to be more careful and the second thing and i always make the same joke uh, a lot of times there is a misunderstanding and we always consider that if someone is vegan is someone who's having a healthy diet and that doesn't necessarily mean that it's like that i always make the same joke i have a friend who was vegan and his diet was basically coke and chips and obviously that's not a healthy diet okay <laughs> and now there is a boom of super processed foods that they are advertising themselves like vegan gluten free no gmos blah 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 but still are not healthy food at the end of the day the food that is healthy and the food that you that you that your body needs and wants is the food that doesn't need any kind of advertisement because it's food that it's not it's eating an apple or a vegetable that is slightly raw, taken from there, washed, and, and that's the end of the story. So I just wanted to, to reinforce that idea because sometimes we get so confused with that. And I mean, it is very easy to, to get confused because they do it very well. I mean, totally agree with you. Products. They sell the products like, yeah, vegan or vegetarian or you know, all those things. And, and we just, make directly the association of that being healthy, which a lot of times might not be as healthy as it looks. Totally agree with you. There is a lot now of, there is even more processed foods in the vegan world than in the regular yeah. world because, you know, people think, oh, I'm going to be skinnier or I'm going to be this or I'm going to, it's totally, you, you are right. And I'm going to give you a simple example. My stepdaughter, she went to Penn State last year. She started to go to college and she was vegan like us. She decided and she went vegan for almost two years. But then she couldn't find really like, the food to 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 provide her the you know the the energy to function and mm -hmm. she didn't have a choice but to go back to an, an omnivore diet you know and you know there is no other option there the, the doctor told her listen that you it's very difficult because whatever products like you mentioned they are like in the market they were very unhealthy so she didn't have a choice the same when someone is trying to conceive there is some people that are vegan diet from really, like you say, knowledge and research, and they really know, like, what are the nutrients I'm taking? This is good, this is not. But there is some that definitely they need to go back to certain foods. Mm -hmm. One last thing I wanted to mention that I forgot, that is also part of our lifestyle and, and all of this is household products. Uh, Maria, I don't know if you have that knowledge, you know, what we used to clean our house, mm -hmm. uh, you know, all these uh, um, Clorox cleaners. I also, yeah. that's a little part I recommend also when someone comes to me, I tell them today in the supermarkets and in the world, we can find more organic with less chemicals like the makeup, our makeup, uh, cleaning products, all of that. I try to recommend, you know, as much organic and as much natural you can find because I think that all these parabens and chemicals also can affect our fertility. I wanted to mention that. I couldn't agree more with you, Monica, about that. And I think that we could we could do another webinar on this topic because we were speaking about that for, for an hour as well. But yeah, a lot of a lot of the chemicals that we're exposed to through the, the cleaning products that we use at home, through our makeup, through the clothes that we're wearing, everything. I mean, there, there are lots of those that have um, what we call um uh, an effect of an endocrine disruptor, which means that they can mess up with our hormone imbalance and they can add like to have negative effects on our health and our lifestyle. It is true that uh, most of those 
uh, products have to go through a lot of uh, a lot of controls by the in the case of the US by the Food and Drug Administration here in the U in Europe through the EFSA. But the, the fact that they are safe or that in the amounts that they are used are safe doesn't that doesn't necessarily mean that they are good for our health. And a lot of times there are some products that are not regulated or that they are products that are new that they have started using and they have not even tested them uh, enough. So, so sometimes it's not that clear. And again, I, I agree with, with Monica, the, the more natural, the better. Definitely, definitely. You know, like, unfortunately, today, you know, in our countries, Europe, here in the States, there is a lot of regulations in how you make products and all of that. People is becoming more aware. Um, unfortunately, for example, here in my country and in other countries, a lot of people is telling others, doctors, uh, coaches, you know, check also where your products are made made from, you know. Unfortunately, you know, in China, for example, there is no regulations on how doing things. So a lot of things like even in the, the plates that you eat, I always recommend make sure that they are made in a country that has at least certain regulations because it's affecting our, our health. So what you mentioned is so true and, and they can um, said it's healthy, but it's not. Uh, so, you know, all what we are providing here with Dr. Maria is really for you guys to, it's not difficult, it's not impossible, we can uh, actually train ourselves to to become more healthier, not only for our fertility, but for our daily life and, and work and our activities. Uh, Dr. Maria, I really, really appreciate your time. And if there is any last uh, thing, and because like you said, we need to definitely work on more webinars, which is what I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm doing with F30. I love to be partners with you because there is always little missing things that we need to touch more because fertility is such like a, a big work. Uh, but if there is anything extra that you want to add before we end our webinar today. Yeah, I just, just want to make a final comment on, on everything that we discussed. Um, that is that sometimes when depending on what is our actual situation in terms of our lifestyle, it can look, it can seem very overwhelming to have to do lots of changes. If that is your case, what I would recommend is just to, to try to avoid being overwhelmed by just setting small goals, small goals that are uh, things that are tangible that you can that you can just check on how you're doing and just focus on one small thing. Let's say, for example, that if you are not doing great, instead of thinking I have to do perfect vegan diet, so no, let's start by um, improving your breakfast for a whole week or two weeks. And after having improved your breakfast, then you can focus on also improving your lunch. And little by little, you will be adding up lots of things that you do consistently on a daily basis. After some time, you will be amazed about all the changes that you have been able to do. That's maybe it. And that uh, if you want, you can. So I, I just want to encourage everyone to try to stay as healthy as possible. And I just wanted to thank you, Monica, because I really enjoyed the webinar. I love speaking about these topics, so I could stay here and um, <laughs> speaking about that for, for a very long time. And for sure, I will be I will be very happy to organize another webinar about any topic that you guys are interested in or that you, Monica, want to suggest. So definitely, we will be seeing each other soon again to discuss more interesting things related with, with fertility. So thank you again, Dr. Maria. Uh, so as you say, we will really be working on more webinars. I have another one upcoming with you in August and we will be planning more. Uh, for all of you, uh, this live is going to be on the group. I'm going to, you know, I think that you guys also, Ferti is going to post it in their YouTube channel. So you're going to have it there. If you have any questions, you can post it below in the comments, tag me or uh, tag the, Dr. Maria, and then we will see and answer the questions. You know, we keep all the webinars live i put them in the announcements as again i said they're going to be in our youtube channels so any questions that come up you can uh, put it there also if you have any subject that you want dr maria and ferti and me to talk about it please feel free to post it too and we can arrange to create another webinar thank you very much everyone and i hope to see you again soon goodbye Bye.